this will be a very big moment. I mean, this is literally the biggest poker tournament that's ever happened. The reason this tournament's so unique is a lot of the biggest high rollers in the world either pop up somewhere in Asia, say like Manila, there'll be a giant Triton, or Vegas will have the million dollar buy in one drop. But the collective forces have never put their efforts together, and now we're seeing what can happen when they do join up. This is the biggest super high roller tournament in the history of the world, and that's the main reason why. The best players in the world aren't necessarily playing uh, mid-stakes or low-stakes, they're playing the highest game in the room. I haven't played many tournaments the last few years, but I couldn't miss this one. So this tournament is like, people have asked me about my parents, how do you feel, are you excited? And I tried best to describe it to them, actually. I said, it's almost like a World Cup final, like it's something that you could never dream of as a kid. It's gonna be the biggest day of gambling I've ever had by far. It's literally the biggest buy-in tournament ever, and I'm there, so that makes me really happy because that's kind of been the way I rank myself against other players for my whole career. I will never participate in something like this again. Never have before, likely never will again. It is just going to be such a unique experience. Oh, how would it feel to win this? That's probably gonna be the greatest feeling in poker history. You wanna win this high roller tournament, you're gonna to have to get through me if you wanna do it. But winning a freeze out with all the best players in the world and all the best amateurs in the world at the highest stakes doesn't get much better than that. Indeed it does not, Mr. Petrangelo. Welcome, one and all, to the Hilton on Park Lane in London, one of the most multicultural cities in the world and a fitting stage for these 54 players who come from all over, each having paid one million pounds to compete in the richest poker tournament in history. Ali Najad alongside Daniel Negranu. And Daniel, what an incredible event we have on our hands here. This has never happened in the history of poker, where an event, especially of this magnitude, separates the pros and the non-pros. I'm super excited to see how that plays out, especially in the early going. 11 places will be paid. 1.1 million pounds, the minimum payout if you're in the money, with 19 million hanging up top. As we saw the breakdown there of the 54 million pound prize pool, another important aspect of this event, 2.7 million pounds raised for charity. 50K per player going to that end. As you get a look at our featured table here, which has no shortage of talent, both on the professional and non-professional side of the spectrum. Blinds are at 1,500 and 3,000 with a 3K ante. Everyone starting with 1 million in chips and Timofey Kuznetsov, true teller starting with a limp sitting on king-queen offsuit. Well, very interesting there, because most literature you read is gonna tell you, hey, when you play poker, you gotta raise or fold. And uh, I would adhere to that unless you are as talented as someone like Kuznetsov, who has a good feel uh, in terms of balance and what to limp with. So it uh, should be interesting to see how that plays out the rest of the day with him you know, adding limps into his uh, range of hands. Chan Wai Liang with the ace eight suited, thinning the field behind with a raise to 11,000, which Kuznetsov calls. And they get a look at an ace king seven rainbow flop. Top pair for Chan Wai and for Timofey, second pair. Well, obviously, uh, Chan Wai in the lead here with an ace would be very difficult for Kuznetsov to get away from it here, flopping second pair with the best possible kicker, facing a relatively small bet. Action on the Russian after a C-bet of 12,000, which of course he will call and take a peek at the turn, which is an eight now giving Leong two pair, aces and eights. Well, that's a really big card for uh, Leong here because you know if he was up against ace 10 or ace jack, he's just improved. So he's gonna wanna get value against those hands. Uh, obviously if he knew Kuznetsov had a hand like King Queen, he might wanna bet a little to sort of string him along. 32,500 into 53, the number he came with on the turn after the second check from Kuznetsov. And the problem here for Timofey Daniel, if he calls that bet, he could potentially be facing an even larger third barrel on the end, so he decides to just release. Yeah, and I think that's why he probably folded, because that's a tough lay down there, you know? You're up against a player who's likely very aggressive, and you know, you've got a pretty strong hand, but uh, obviously don't beat any combinations that include an ace in him, so. Well, you want to talk about Aggressive, Daniel. How about Tom Dwan, the man who just bludgeoned the poker world for so long online when he had his coming out party? Yeah, but you know, now he's aged. 
He's, you know, he's like, he's, you know, he's, he's slowed down a little bit. He's opened up to Queens as his starting range. Yeah, now he plays hands like Queens, right? He used to be the guy in there with 10-6 offsuit all the time. Well, we may still see some 10-6 offsuit out of him, but he is open to 8,000 with these ladies. And for Vivek Rajkumar, another one of the pros seated at this feature table, it is a three bet to 35,000, ill-timed with the suited connector. And behind him, Elton Sang with the ace king, four bets to 100K, 10% of the starting stacks. Yeah, so obviously Raj Kumar here is sort of putting pressure on a button raise. It's a hand 7-8 suited that plays pretty well post-flop. Elton, of course, with Ace King against these late position players is going to look to possibly win it before the flop or get more money in. Wow, what a flop. Oh, my. Jack nine deuce with two diamonds, giving Raj Kumar the gut shot straight flush draw, saying with just two overs, backdoor nut diamonds, and Dwan with the over pair and two checks in front of him. 303,000 in the pot already. Oh, and some kerosene added to the fire here, courtesy of the Four of Diamonds, which gives Raj Kumar the flush. Tsang, the nut flush draw with the two overs, and Dwan with a queen high flush draw on the over pair. Well, this is going to be big trouble for both Elton and Dwan. Elton can't fold here with the Ace of Diamonds. Dwan has an over pair with a diamond. What? That didn't just happen. That is shocking that he would fold there with two over cards and the Ace of Diamonds. He didn't take much time to do so. Now for Tom, he's going to be in a pickle here. Uh, tough to fold with the over pair. It's, it's a best hand a lot of the time. And he's also got a flush draw. Trying to get a read on his buddy. I'm still trying to find out what Elton Sang was thinking, folding the ace of diamonds in this spot. Obviously correct. Yeah, I think most players would have called there for sure. And speaking of calls, that's what Tom Dwan is forced to do. A fold, a mistake, and a raise, an even bigger one. So another 420,000 into the middle. Now the ace of spades on the end. So this is oddly a good card for Tom Dwan because if he was up against a hand like ace king or ace queen with a diamond, you know, he can fold now because there's very few bluffs that Vivek could have. 350K the sizing, and you can see Dwan uncomfortable in this spot, understandably. I mean, imagine that card is the three of clubs. You know, Dwan is going to have to call that bet without much thought, but. Looks like he's using a time bank or two here. Yeah, you may have noticed that LED cube there on the table, a dynamic shot clock, which varies street to street. Now, trying to find a hand that you can beat here is difficult because you were three bet from the small blind. You have a couple queens that block some stuff. The reduce the diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> Vivek. Giving Duan a sporting earful there uh -oh. as he collects a sizable pot. And Sang wondering if that ace might have been good. Yeah. Yeah. The shot clocks in this poker tournament are unique. They are quite fast pre-flop, and you get a little more time per street. You get 20 seconds before the flop, 25 seconds on the flop, 30 seconds on the turn, and then 30 seconds on the river. Now that may sound like quite a lot of time, but 30 seconds whizzes by so fast. If, say, you make a bet and an opponent has put you all in on the river, 30 seconds feels like two seconds. You have to think about hundreds of different elements into this poker hand, down to what your cards are, what your side card is. Do you have a physical tell on this person? If you take a little more time, will they give off something? What is the price you're getting? So you have to consider the math element, the human element, and under all of this, you have to have a clear enough head to do this in under 30 seconds. It's gonna be really, really extreme whenever you're playing for a million pounds. For the first six levels of play on day one, the professionals and the non-professionals will be separated, eventually merging on level seven. Now you may think that the non-pros side of the draw may be a little less testing, but you may want to park that thought after taking a look at Paul Pua's table. No doubt about that, Marianella. Get a look at seats one through three. Paul Pua, founder of the Triton Series, without whom we wouldn't be here. Rob Young, founder of the Dust Till Dawn Casino up in Nottingham in the UK. And then Leon Sukranik, the founder of the Kings Casino over in Rosvedov. Daniel, all super high stakes cash game players. Yeah, this is part of what makes this format so cool. The first six levels, we've separated the pros from the non-pros, so uh, we're gonna see a different style of poker, I would imagine, too, going forward. Well, that style thus far is an under-the-gun min-raise out of king-queen for Rob Young, a flat from Sukernik's Jack-10, and Winford Yu's suited connector. Now Aaron Zhang out of the small blind with the squeeze to 50K. 
Well, this very aggressive play here, taking advantage of maybe a read on Yong being weak. Uh, and typically when you have a couple people call a raise, they're not all that strong. So these plays are very effective if you can get them by the very first razor, which he has, but okay. sticky. Leon is uh, coming with the Jack-10. Yeah, Sukernik is not a guy who is easily intimidated at the poker table, no doubt about that, and he'll take this flop in position, but not connect with the 7-6 Trey 2 club flop. However, Aaron Zhang doesn't connect either. This is a good example here of the power of aggression pre-flop in this spot. Um, Zhang being the pre-flop aggressor, he's gonna take the lead on this flop, and if Leon doesn't hit, he picks it up. Now, if Leon does call, he's got a lot of decisions to make. Uh, on the turn, depending what rolls off. Tearing one off for Leon would certainly be in the hopes that Aaron would check having not improved with maybe a couple of over cards, but instead he folds and Zhang will pick up the first pot here at the non-pro table. Solid pickup. Who's the favorite? What, what price will you give me on never using a time bank? Okay. The whole tournament? Hey, depends yeah. on your bust. The odds maker <laughs> right here. Oh. What, what price I don't use a time bank ever? I want to bet myself. I never use the tournament. Yeah. Well, it's not a track meet, but I suspect Rob Young certainly will be capable of making the fastest decisions here at the table, and he wants to bet it. Meanwhile, Paul, with Ace-10 suited on the button, opens to 10K. Yeah, notice Rob Young is in a million buy-in, yet doesn't have enough action, wants to bet on his ability to play quickly. <laughs> the guys come in disguise. Eight, seven, deuce as both Young's King Jack and Sukernik's Queen Seven came along for the ride. Advantage Leon with middle pair here. And he's betting it, 15K. Both his opponents have missed here. Paul does have position, a couple over cards, backdoor flush draw. Some things could happen for a small bet, and he decides to call. As does Young to close the action. Another 45K sliding into the pot. And the turn, the four of spades, doesn't change anything. Well, now if you're Leon, you, you, know, you wonder. You got two calls on this flop. Uh, I still think this might be worth a bet. You know, get them off some straight draws or over cards. But he decides to check. And that opens the door for Paul here in position. 78K up for grabs, Daniel. Well, I mean, imagine Paul called this flop with a plan, and it looks like he plans to execute it grabbing for some chips, contemplating whether or not this is a spot he can represent something and steal the pot, and it looks like he's going for it. Gets through the King Jack, and how will Leon react? Well, a tough spot for Leon. He's the man that usually puts other people in tough spots. And notice, if he would have bet here, he wouldn't be in this spot, but he decides to let go of it, and a nice pickup from Paul there with nothing. No doubt about that. The man to whom we owe a debt of gratitude as he is the founder of the Triton Poker Series. And despite being a non-pro, he's got 11 and a half million in career tournament earnings and the most cash as ever in the Triton Series with 16 total. Also, this is an invite event when it comes to the pros and he chose to invite Tom Dwan to the party. The two of them go back a ways and disaster brewing here for Pua who has two kings, while Zhang holds two aces. The open to 8,000 has been three bet to 26, and the fuse is lit. Well, now it's important to note that both these players are very deep. You know, the structure's very slow. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not Zhang can figure out a way to really get maximum value. And he's electing to four bet here. 95K total. And now if you're in Paul's spot, obviously you like your hand, but you ask yourself, okay, well, if Zhang's not bluffing, what does he have? Ace-King, aces. Cool. He decides to just play it slow and calls to see a flop. And that flop, 7-8-9 with a couple of hearts. Very coordinated board. Yeah, neither player is going to love this board, thinking that the other may have hit it. A lot of bad cards can come off on the turn, whether it's a 6 or a 10 or a jack, putting out a 4 straight. Half pot size C bet from Zhang gets flatted by Paul, who is proceeding with a great deal of caution. And this could be an action freezer on the turn as Ford was straight show up. Yeah, neither player is going to like that card. Imagine the action will slow here, but it looks like Paul's grabbing for some chips. And he's fired 180K into roughly 400. 
Yeah, so this bet is, is like a little bit, well, I'm representing something, but I'm also protecting my hand. I'm also finding out where you're at. And we have a non-believer in Zhang who's made the call. And it's a very interesting call out of position by Zhang given that another barrel on the end would really put those aces in a bind. Oh, but if you're I'm, Paul, I'm you think, well, my kings are probably good, right? I mean, if this guy's got queens, I'm good. But again, he can't beat a lot of hands. The question was whether or not he should bluff there. He chose not to. And perhaps a wise <laughs> choice, though we'll never know whether or not Aaron Zhang was going to call with the two aces if Paul would have fired big. Meanwhile, back over to the all pro side of the spectrum. We find Tom Dwan choosing to limp the cutoff with ace-jack off suit. Well, this is a little bit sneaky. Ace-jack's a hand you'd expect a raise from that position. So uh, Tom understands maybe if he's going to limp some weaker Elton. hands, he's got to have some strong Elton. hands in his range so he's not easily read. Thank you, Elton. So bad. <laughs> Vivek expressing gratitude for saying not having kicked him out of the pot with a raise. And for that matter, Dwan as well. Flop coming ace-deuce-deuce. Huh? Elton. With the nut flush draw and Dwan with the ace jack, in. ace is up. <laughs> Four. So this is a spot where Tom could elect to check back. Uh, he decides to go ahead and bet. I'm not sure what he's hoping to get action from, maybe a flush draw. The danger here is you're up against the blinds. So normally deuce deuce isn't scary, but it is when both players are in on the blinds. They could have any two cards, and you see Zhang's check raise from 4 to 10,000 isn't exactly welcome sights for right. Tom Dwan. He calls the extra six, now the four of diamonds on the turn, giving Sang the nut flush. Yeah, so I like this play from Elton on the flop to check raise, and now he's made the nut flush, so he's gonna look to extract some value from Tom, who, gonna be a tough fold here with Ace Jack. Does not have a diamond in his hand, and is facing a 16K bet, exactly half pot. And then if you're, you're in Tom's seat, you're thinking, okay, well, what do I beat? If he has a deuce, I'm behind. If he had two diamonds, I'm behind. So I only beat Elton if he's just kind of overplaying an ace or, you know, making a random bluff. Oh, and this is a problematic river for Dwan, as just in case Elton had him out kicked, he now has aces and jacks. Well, right now Tom can beat ace four. He can beat, you know, ace queen, which is unlikely. Uh, he still can't beat a deuce or a flush, though. So despite improving to aces and jacks, it really didn't change much in terms of his hand strength. It only affects him really beating ace four, which is very unlikely for Elton to have here. How often does Elton just have air in this spot? Well, that's the real question, you know. Uh, if, if a player does have air, is he going to check, raise, flop, bet, turn, and go forward on the river with the triple barrel? Tom believes no, so he, he makes a really strong lay down there with aces and jacks. Getting away from the loser. You certainly want to make a habit of doing that if you want to end up at the final table. Slipping back over to the non-pro side, we find Orpen Kissa Chicago with his first involvement. Nine deuce deuce. Advantage win for you in the three-way affair. His pocket fives checking along with Zhang, who has ace four suited, and Orpen with a C bet. Pretty standard here for the pre-flop raiser to bet a dry board like that. Um, Winfred's in a little bit of a tough spot here with, you know, the fives, but he's not going to fold just because Orpen bet, because he also understands Orpen's going to bet with any two cards here. Interesting call from, or raise, pardon me, from Zhang, trying to represent the deuce. Wow. Hero moves here out of the big blind. Well, early on, we've seen Zhang show some real aggression earlier with the king eight of hearts, three betting pre-flop, and now here, representing a deuce from the big blind. Winford hanging tough with his fives, which are still good despite Zhang picking up a four. You know, this is a really strong read from Winford to call a raise here with just fives. He can't beat a nine, can't beat a deuce, obviously. He must have played with Zhang before and realized, you know what, this guy's capable of doing some frisky things. And now a three on the end. Not a particularly complicated development for the fives. And Winford's reaching for chips after Zhang checked back on the turn and wants to bet this thing. Well, yeah, it's a small bet. It's like a blocker bet. A little bit strange for him to bet here. Um, he has just the hand to beat Zhang, who is contemplating here. But really, what, what can Zhang beat when Winfred calls a flop bet? calls the raise, you got to think fours are no good, and he makes the fold. So interesting play there from Winfred. And of course, we see Zhang continuing to play aggressively. 
but at 1.5 to 1, you can take the pro edge. Of course. Yeah. Blind versus blind here with the action folded around to Tsang small blind. He has ace king and makes it 10,000 to go. Timothy Adams in the big with king three dominated. But you don't want to make a habit of just letting go of your big blind all the time when the small comes for you. Well, exactly. You have position. King three is not a great hand. It's not a top 10 hand, as Phil Helmuth would say. But uh, in position, it's worth seeing a flop. And he's flopped the king, but it's trouble because Elton has him out kicked with the ace. Big time trouble. King Jack, eight, two spades, 23K in the middle, and Elton laying a little trap. Yeah, I kind of, well, they both check it now. Interesting. Wow. Disaster turn card after the check back from Adams. He makes kings and threes to down the ace king. Well, Elton has to feel like he has the best hand here with top pair, top kicker especially given the texture of that flop. There are not a lot of hands that connect with the board that wouldn't want to fire on that flop, Daniel. Absolutely, and now you're seeing Timothy looking to extract some value here. Uh, there are a couple draws, so this is important. When he raises here, he could be sort of saying, well, I've either got a really, really good hand or I have a spade draw, a diamond draw, something funky like that, which could confuse Elton, and it, you know, it has. He's obviously not gonna fold here with the strength of hand that he has. Some straight draws available as well as saying calls the raise and a completely innocent deuce of clubs hits the river. All right, that's a card that doesn't change a thing. There's no sound, because I'm not used to this. No reason for Elton to lead out here. If Adams is bluffing, let him go. 157 in the middle, and Adams comes with a buck 25 of it. Well, this is a good spot for Adams to bet a lot because, again, if your opponent was on a draw, he's not calling anyway. But if he does have a king, he's going to be hard pressed to lay that down, and he can't lay the ace king down, of course. Wow. Speaking of wow, Daniel, we're going to get over to one of our outer tables where we have a developing pot between Andrew Pantling and Rick Solomon, the man who has made three straight seven-figure final tables, is all in and at risk with two overs, a gutty, and the nut flush draw. But up against top set, he needs a 10 or a spade. Not there on the turn. All in for 642. Not there on the river either. And just like that, in level one, we lose Rick Solomon. What an absolute cooler. If I'm Rick Solomon, I see that flop. I'm excited to get my chips in, too. You can't blame him one bit. Pantling picking up all the Solomon bucks, and he is your chip leader. Rick Solomon, he's, uh, he's like an old buddy of mine. And, uh, you know, we're both, we both play like pretty gangster poker, I think. So one of us is going to build up chips, and one of us is going to bust. So it happens. Here with Andrew Pantling, who's responsible for our first bust out of this Triton Million, Rick Solomon. Somebody like Rick Solomon, who has made the money in three seven-figure events. How does it feel? I know you guys also made the final table in Monte Carlo, another huge event. How does it feel to knock out somebody like Rick Solomon? Well, I mean, it feels good. Obviously, I feel bad for Rick. I mean, it's pretty tough when you fly all the way to London buying for a huge amount and don't make it through the first level. Uh, Especially to be the, the first bust out. The first bust out makes it even more painful. And you know what? The hand was pretty automatic. Um, we did play together before. Uh, he thinks I'm crazy. Maybe he's right about that. We played a hand early, which validated that I'm crazy. And then the exact same thing happened. Uh, he had queens. Oh, sorry, I had queens. He had ace king of spades. Um, it came with a flush draw. Yeah. A whole bunch of chips went in before the flop. And he did exactly what anyone would do. He just uh, didn't hit the spade. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Andrew. No problem. Thanks, Mariel. Classy there out of Pantling, acknowledging that were the roles reversed, he probably would have been the man out the door. No question, that was a cooler. I to find out. That's why we're just Kuznetsov back over at the pro table with and Cowboys. Like makes it 9K to go. And two tens for Leong here could be troublesome. Oh, definitely troublesome. You know, we saw Chan play aggressive with the ace eight of clubs earlier. This is a spot where he may actually three bet, which you see that he is to 30,000. Kuznetsov has to like the sound of that. Duan releasing the queen jack off suit. So now the question, if you're Kuznetsov out of position, is this a spot where you want to go ahead and four bet or just flat and slow play it? Right. Looks like we have our answer as Kuznetsov wants additional chips inserted. Yeah, and that's not the news you wanted to hear if you were Chan. Still plenty deep in position with tens. He could be up against an ace king. It is Kuznetsov. He's frisky. Could have a lot of hands. Top set. There we see a king. Wow. 
Just a smash job here, and the board dry enough given the preflop action, Daniel, for Kuznetsov to try to trap, but instead he's going to see bet downsizing to 57k, though, in the process. Yeah, so if you're Chan here and you put him on a range of hands at four bets, ace-king's in there. So if it wasn't ace-king, it's aces, kings, you can't beat queens, you can't beat jacks. Still, though, in position, it's worth one peel for such a small price that he was laid. And that's exactly what Kuznetsov had in mind when he came with the 57K. Keeps his man in there as the board pairs on the turn. 321 plus in the middle. Now, what's the number on the turn for Timofey? Well, here's where it's interesting. He could check. You know, he could check this back, let him catch up. If Chan hits a 10 on the river, we have fireworks. You have to ask yourself, if you have all the kings, what can your opponent really have that's going to call? Very good point. And if it's aces, it's probably going to bet. I'm surprised by this. I thought this is a spot where Kuznetsov might just decide to set the trap. But now he's given Chan a chance to get away. 115 to call. With a potential third bullet on the end. And Liang way too good to get caught up in there. Releases the two tens as Kuznetsov takes it down. The unique thing about the Triton Million event is that it's half pros and half non-pros, and that's never been done before. Unbelievable for professional poker players. Half the field is actual amateurs. When you're looking at just the pro side and it's stacked with the very best No Limit Hold'em players in the world, it's intimidating to say the least. A lot of the amateurs in this tournament are fantastic poker players. It's great for them that they get to play the first six levels against one another because they get to work the edge off. So once you work off those butterflies, you generally will start to think clearer, you'll, you'll take time. So that adjustment period, I, I actually think, is gonna be quite crucial for these guys. For someone like me, it obviously creates an environment where I wouldn't otherwise be playing. I think it's gonna be interesting to see what some guys that aren't used to that, uh, how they adjust. It's gonna be fun. I look forward to battling with these guys. I battle with them all the time. I may be in a pot against one of my best friends in the world, but if I draw a hand that I have to bluff with, you'll see me bluff with it. So I'm not afraid of anybody. Like, I'm just here to fight. Once level seven comes in, it's gonna be really, really interesting because it's gonna get much better for one side and much, much worse for the other. No question, level seven is when we will see the fireworks as the insulation gets ripped off and the field is merged. Meanwhile, Timothy Adams with ace five suited opens to 7,000. Duan with King Jack, his stack has slid down to 581K. Yeah, no question. I mean, interesting now and even more so after the merge, if you will, seeing if the pros are going to make any major adjustments playing at a much softer table. When I say softer, I typically mean, you know, you're not always up against some sort of guy who's been in the lab for years uh, studying poker. Queen 10-4 with a couple of spades here as the preflop raiser flops the nut flush draw up against an open ender for Duan. Two checks in front of Timothy. Good situation here for Adams in position with the nut flush draw, which is the best hand. Duan absolutely has to continue here. Uh, he has a open into straight draw, the king of spades for some backdoor fun stuff. He's gonna like this flop as well. And as you mentioned, Duan needs to make something happen. His stack dwindling, he's gonna elect to play this aggressively and go for the check raise on this flop. Yeah, trying to make something happen to the tune of 48,000. So now, interesting, if you're Adams, you know that Tom likely has a made hand. You have the ace high flush draw. Well, that means Tom doesn't. Sure, Tom could have jack nine of spades or something like that, which you'd love right now as you've got the nut flush. Tough spot here for Dwan because not only does he have the straight draw, he has the king of spades, which gives him a king high flush draw, which obviously we know wouldn't be any good. 93. Not shying away, he bets 93,000. So if you're Adams, the only question is, you know, do I raise now or, or continue to set the trap for the river? And against a player like Duan, I think it makes sense to just smooth call here. And, uh, you know, hopefully Duan goes for a big bluff on the river and you can snap him off with the nuts. A paired board would be the only problem for an ace high flush. And on the river, the eight of diamonds means Adams has the nuts as Dwan now checks. So now if you're Dwan, right, you think, well, my opponent, you know, he's probably got a queen. 
can I get him off that hand? And he decides, no. He checks, and Adams goes pretty big here. 600,000 putting Duan essentially all in, and obviously Duan's not going to call with just the king high that missed. He should be happy that he missed, though. If he hit, it would have cost him. Well, it's cost a lot of people when they've locked horns with Timothy Adams through the years. That's how the 33-year-old has managed to pick up over 17 million in career tournament earnings. <laughs> it's very likely to dominate you. Tom Dwan down to 435K now as ace jack of spades and opens to 9,000. You know, down to just 400 is true, but this structure's so deep, there's no reason for Dwan to panic. He's still got plenty of big blinds and maneuverability. 140 of them. Like 350 or something? Roughly. 425 more. Which is Thank you. as deep as you could hope to be in the early goings of virtually any tournament, and certainly one where you're buying in a million pounds, as both Adams and Kurganov have flatted. 425. Kuznetsov taking a peek at an ace queen here out of the big. Perhaps a glass of fresh squeeze? Yeah, could be. Could be a spot where, you know, Dwan does open a lot of pots. He might feel like this is a good opportunity to just pick up what's there pre flop, and he's going to re raise to 52 5. I like this. I think there are no real concerns about Adams and Kurganov, and you're targeting Dwan who does have a hand here, ace-jack of spades. And, you know, Dwan's a little bit frustrated right now. You have to imagine, you know, with the start that he's had. So it'd be hard to lay this down. He's going to want to take a flop. In goes 52 total. Out goes queen-jack. And the duck soup. So this could be trouble for Tom Dwan if the flop comes ace-high. Instead, it's queen high, but two spades as well as Kuznetsov flops top pair, top kicker against the nut flush draw. Yeah, fireworks will ensue. The question is, is it going in on the flop or is it going in later? But the chips will be going in here. A three bet pot, you flop the nut flush draw. If you're Kuznetsov, you flop top pair, ace kicker. Nobody's going anywhere. All the chips will get in here, I would imagine. But Dwan's not obligated to bloat this pot, right? You talked about how deep he is. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. But again, it is a three-bet pot. Uh, he doesn't have to raise now. He could, you know, get frisky on the turn. I just don't see many scenarios where, you know, Tom doesn't get all his chips in here with the nut flush draw. Let's see how he approaches things on the flop. It looks like a raise to 132. Yeah, that's me saying, you know, hey, I'm Tom Dwan. I'm ready to go. Let's get it in. I would imagine Kuznetsov is very Much aware of the that. situation. Asking for a count is Timofey. Not much reason to just flat call here. He might as well just stick it in. If he's ahead, great. I mean, what can he really be behind? Two kings? If Duan decided to slow play it, unlikely. A set of sixes? Mm, unlikely. So if I'm here with ace-queen and I'm Kuznetsov, I like the situation. And I think that Duan kind of made his statement given he was willing to put 132 of what he had behind in on the flop. Timofey mm -hmm. can rest assured he's not going to lose his customer. So the chips do get in. Duan does not hit the necessary spade on the turn and needs to see one here on the river if he's going to stay alive. Instead, it's the Ten of Diamonds, and down goes Durr. Wow, early exit from the pro side. You know, you got to imagine the non-pros will be excited to see Tom go. He's a threat to win any tournament that he enters. And whenever you're in the room and you see a man walking around during non-break time, bad things have happened. After busting Rick Solomon, Andrew Pantling started the first break as the chip leader, doubling his starting stack to 2 million in chips. Right behind him with 1.5 million in chips was Igor Korganov. Now Aaron Zhang, Vivek, and Timothy Adams did round out that top five. Three of those players all started this tourney at table 10, which was the home of Tom Dwan, until Timothy Kuznetsov sent him to the rail earlier than expected. Non-pro table here, and we get our first look at Shanghai Wang, who's enjoying a massage. It's stressful out there, Daniel. Certainly is, especially when you're playing long days, uh, having a lot of tough decisions. And he's up against here Andrew Pantling, who will put you to the test. I've played a decent amount with him. Very aggressive and tough to play against. Feeling sticky with a six-deuce suited in the big blind as Shanghai attacked from the small. 
as his man dominated, going to the flop, which is seven trade deuce, both players with a piece. Yeah, you would expect in position, Pantling sees this flop and thinks, all right, well, you know what? My deuce is probably good. And notice Shanghai did not follow through with top pair, electing to check call as Pantling fired, and now both players pick up a gut shot straight draw on the turn. Notice how quickly Wang is playing here, and same with Pantling, just firing out those bets. Much different than what you'll see at the pro table. Second barrel, 24,000 out of Pantling. And the feeling Andrews got here is that his man raised not in this territory and was just peeling one off. It's hard, he's having the massage. Notice how strong Wang's hand is here. He's also got the flush draw, and there you go, the straight flush. Wow, seven high straight flush, thinking to himself, how do I max out against Pantling, who's just made a straight? And it looks good. Pantling firing 65,000 on the river. Question is, how greedy do you get here with the straight flush? How much will Pantling call? You have the whole wide world, and obviously Shanghai just praying that somehow Pantling has hearts as well. But a straight, certainly enough for him to call. And what's the number? 150. Very small raise. Yeah. That's going to be tough for Pantling to get away from. I don't see a fold here. I mean, your hand's too strong to just fold with the six high straight. A single ace makes a five high straight. And by the way, a single ace very much feels like it could be in Shanghai's range here. You wonder whether or not Pantling might do something heroic by playing back in him. If Pantling's never played against, you know, Wang in this situation. He might not know of how good or bad he is and whether he thinks an ace is good. Very confusing sometimes to play uh, against players who are unorthodox. You can see Pantling really deliberating now, thinking, what is going on here? How do you play this hand this way, where you check call the turn and now you're check raising me? Doesn't add up. But it will. <laughs> oh, a straight flush. As Pantling understandably pays off in a nice pot heading Shanghai's way. So I think that there's something really specific about there being such a big inaugural event, such as the biggest tournament that's ever played, that really gives the players that kind of FOMO that you don't usually get with other tournaments. Usually you can see a spot, you'll think of it as equity or EV. Okay, if I play this, I'll probably make 10K on average or 5K on average. But there's something so specific about playing or not playing the biggest tournament that's ever happened that you, you just feel like, oh man, so I played in the first million for one drop and uh, it was an amazing experience and uh, of course when you like sit so close you cannot each uh, of playing because it's the most prestigious tournament in history. Knowing the emotions and knowing the emotional proclivities of all the people that are playing and being able to just have an insight into the dynamics, the poker dynamics, the emotional dynamics, knowing who swapped action, knowing who's rooting for whom and it, it's still very, it still feels like I'm a part of it even though I'm obviously not a part of it. What it feels like is that Charlie's talking about you, my friend, as yeah. typically we'd see you out there rumbling. For those that don't know, FOMO stands for Fear of Missing Out, and I have it bad watching this action, salivating, and I promise that the next one they have, I will be sitting at one of those seats rather than next to you. Well, while you have it bad, those at home have it good, as we all have the privilege of having you in the booth with us. Our first look at this side of this non-pro table, including Richard Young, who at one time was the number one on the all-time Malaysian money list in front of his son, Wai Kin Young, after winning the 250K Six Max No Limit Hong Kong Dollar event, beating Steve O'Dwyer heads up last year in Montenegro. Since then, Paul Pua has overtaken him. As we see Sasia Jiang three betting this 9K business all the way up to 90K with her ace queen suited. But then Pantling, as I told you, very aggressive and hard to play against. He elects to four bet with the 8-6 of diamonds. Not a play you see every day. Not at all in high risk. In position against Jiang, who makes the call for the extra 90,000. 180 ahead to the Jack-7-6 rainbow board. Advantage Pantling with bottom pair and wrapped around that seven of diamonds nicely. Well, if you're Pantling, you gotta look at this flop and be happy about it. You flop the pair, you've got a three card straight. Uh, you have equity no matter what Jang has, of course, unless she has something like, you know, Jack-Jack. But aside from that, great situation for Pantling here. Tough for Jang, out of position. She does have a backdoor flush draw as well. 
150 to call for Sasia. Does have two overs, backdoor Broadway and club prospects, and she decides she wants to tear one off as the pot swells to 682,000. And there is the nut flush draw for Sasia on the turn as the board pairs. Question is, what do you do now if you're pantling? You got to be concerned here when she does call that maybe she's, you know, got tens or queens and is just playing them carefully. Well, what she's got is the nut flush <laughs> as Pantling check back. And Sasia's going to give him a little bit of rope with this third check on the river. It's not going to work here. He's got the pair. Uh, it might not have worked anyway if she let out, but uh, she was going for the, for the big pot there, the big bluff from Pantling who didn't bite. So a healthy one headed Sasia's way as her stack heads in the right direction. So the overall chip leader at present coming from the non-pro side of the spectrum, that being Aaron Zhang, who is currently sitting with 2.281 million chief among the 54 entries, which are now down to just 52, as we lost Rick Solomon and Tom Dwan in this largest ever prize pool outside of the World Series of Poker main event. Looking at the payouts, 19 million pounds, the biggest first place payout in history, and this the largest field ever for a seven-figure event.